Coming up, celebrating winners in the humanities and dog sledding, and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society encourages youth to pursue STEM careers. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. I'm at Ahopa. Thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in San Diego, California, where the Indian Gaming Association's annual trade show and convention wrapped up. This week, casino executives and tribal leaders attended panels and learned about the latest trends in Indian gaming. But there's another snazzy part of the event. ICT's Kundrea Yazi has more. Walking around the Indian Gaming Association's trade show, you see bright lights and the sounds of machines going off. It is a giant area filled with the latest and greatest and things you can find inside a casino. This year, the trade show floor was packed with people who traveled both near and far. From flashy slot machines testing new game chairs, trying food samples, and entering raffles, there was a lot for attendees to do. This year's theme was the innovation of new technologies. International Game Technology, also known as IGT, told us about their newest slot machine design. What we see here is actually the reveal of IGT's Mystery of the Lamp on our beautiful peak curve cabinet, which you can see is being unveiled here in addition. So compelling hardware and compelling game. There is increasing interest around the new technology. IGA is really a great opportunity for an industry leader such as IGT to meet with many different tribal leaders. And of course, we've been in town all week. We were with Chairman Stevens yesterday, and, and we have many great customers at a, a party that we threw last night. Now on day one of the show, they're all here clamoring to see these games, and, and we always know it's successful when they come and specifically ask for it. Tribal casino owners walked around to see how the new technology could benefit their businesses and communities. As a tribal leader, you know, what I see is, of course, Indian gaming, it's always Indian governmental gaming because, you know, the, the, the proceeds and the revenues go back to tribal nations, to tribal, you know, nation building or tribal nation rebuilding. You know, uh, it goes back to education, it goes back to infrastructure, uh, health care, you know, it goes back to all of those critical needs and issues that our tribal members need, you know, back back in our homelands. But also, you know, we're, we're not about the profits for the next quarter. Um, you know, we're, we look long term. I think that's what we pride ourselves on. Uh, Indian gaming, you know, across Indian country. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, the long term sustainability and strengthening our economies. Gaming takes many forms at casinos across Indian country. For the tribes who aren't as technologically advanced, there can be some setbacks. Tribal casinos have a blind spot and it's around non-carded players. So if, if, if someone has a card and they're using the card, there's all kinds of information they have. The problem they almost all have is they don't know about the people that don't have cards. They don't know how often they come in. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have any way to even reach them with offers. So we help fill in that gap. Give them an email address, give them a phone number, give them ways to at least start to communicate with them. And then some of them will convert over time. Many of them maybe never will but at least there's a way to communicate hey we've got this new thing going on or try this or here's a free play offer or whatever the casino wants to do with this the fact that they actually have a way to reach all these people and we're seeing great conversions we're see we're helping casinos convert people to carded play and we're helping them engage with the ones that just won't ever convert through you know digital marketing the trade show also served as a platform. ICT regular contributor Holly Cook Macaro took the opportunity to promote her upcoming podcast with Illuminative. 
In San Diego, California, Quindre Yazi, ICT News. In Brazil, a museum that housed priceless indigenous artifacts and recordings is recovering from a massive fire. Last week, Brazil's president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, visited the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro, which was partially destroyed by fire in 2018. Masks, vases, and ceremonial capes dating back at least a century from at least 130 people in all are gone. The museum also contained recordings of indigenous languages, some some that are no longer spoken. These were the only existing records of several native Brazilian languages, and for the majority of these, there were no digital backups. Speaking during the visit, the country's education minister, Camilo Santana, said they are working to open it to the public very soon. We are now going to finish and guarantee the necessary resources that are missing and anticipate the schedule. The museum continues to open one wing at a time with the full building scheduled to reopen in 2027. We're joined now by ICT's Ripley Simone Kennebrew. Ripley, I understand you went on a little field trip yesterday. Yes, Olia, there's a change coming to a major museum in Arizona, and it's something Native people in the area have advocated for. Take a look. The Pueblo Grande Museum in Phoenix is switching things up. It has been renamed to the Sudufaki Museum. The name represents the connection between local Altham and Piposh communities. The museum opened in 1929 and exists to acknowledge the native Hohokam land it sits on and to preserve indigenous artifacts like the platform mounds. These mounds, which are referred to as Vaki, are the last visible parts of the pre-existing villages. They sit as a symbol of the indigenous communities who call this now bustling city home. The public has responded well to the change, and in the fall of this year, an official reopening event will take place, proudly displaying its new and restorative name. In Phoenix, Arizona, Ripley Simone Kennebrew, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. For dedicating her life to strengthening and developing Native American education, Henrietta Mann received the National Humanities Medal from President Joe Biden. Her pioneering efforts led programs and institutions across the country to develop Native American history and culture studies, honoring the ancestors that came before and benefiting generations that follow. Earlier this week, I asked her about the White House event. It was just absolutely a parade of stars, and I was just nothing but this little land-based person. And of course, we look upon our land as sacred. We just sat and watched the parade, and I thought, got to be this person. I'd love to have that autograph from her. I minded my manners. <laughs> we saw shortly after you got the medal from the president that you whispered something into his ear. What did you say to him? It was crazy. I had told him when he was putting the medal over my head, don't you dare knock my glasses off my face. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were still giggling for that, but I, I, it, was, it was just such a pressure point in my life. Can you imagine that an 88-year-old can forget what she said to the president of the United States of America? <laughs> Star struck with him, too. I touched him. And uh, he's real, and he's much more personable on a one-to-one -one level than he comes across on television. You've taught at the University of Montana, and you led the Native American Studies program. What inspired you to become an educator? This is a long story, Aaliyah, but when I was about the age of eight or nine, I encountered my first uh, episode of discrimination. And I was just horrified at the way that the Anglo teacher and some of the uh, parents of, of, of our classmates treated uh, us as Cheyenne children. I rode the bus home about three miles to the tops of dirty Indian, lazy Indian, dumb Indian, and those kinds of things that existed and unfortunately still exist in today's America. My grandfather met me at the bus stop as he could hear me crying. 
And so he talked to me as only an elder could, and I decided then and there, and I was about, I think I was in the third or fourth grade, and I decided that I was going to go and work and be educated and be in a place where those Anglo teachers were, and I would be able to teach Indian students, and I would love them, and I would honor them, and I would treat them as sacred little human beings. So that has been a goal of mine from childhood. And it is something that I worked very hard to attain as I grew up and got my education and uh, went into the teaching profession. What an honor for me to be in the presence of our future on a daily basis and to shape their minds and give them alternative ways of looking at the world, the world that is Irish that we first inhabited, that really produces good human beings. Aside from actually being in the classroom, you've also been on the policy side of things. You were the first woman to direct Indian education programs at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. At that time, what kinds of challenges did you face? <laughs> I had always told my students, if you're gonna make changes, then you make it from within, and I had the opposite opportunity to say no or yes to becoming uh, the director of the Office of Indian Education Program. Uh, there was a female be before me, but she was not Indian. And so I stayed there a year. But unfortunately, I saw the uh, kind of immovable position that federal administrative people can be and offices can be. And I gave one year of my life to try and to change that. But again, helping uh, the 180 or so uh, elementary and secondary schools for which the Bureau of Indian Affairs was responsible. It still has that same responsibility today. But it was a dream come true to be able to begin to change, hopefully from my point of view, the kind of education and the kind of educational treatment that our beloved children, the first generation, uh, this land should be getting that they did not need to be assimilated. They did not need to be acculturated. In fact, the curriculum had to be expanded to include a study of this land's first peoples and its history. Let's actually talk a, more, a little bit more about that. Um, I'd love to talk about the changes that you've seen in college curriculums. Uh, what makes you smile and what makes you wish that there was more progress? Oh, I graduated with my master's degree from Oklahoma State University and the employment office called me in one day and said, we think that you might be interested in this job. And it was an advertisement for faculty members to join the Native American Studies Program at San Francisco State College. I called there, of all people, I talked to uh, some of the leaders in the activist movement and I was told that UC Berkeley was hiring and that maybe I should call there because they were out on the run. They were out at Alcatraz. And so I did call Berkeley, uh, talk to the people there, was interviewed was, and eventually was offered a job. And I went to uh, the, the San Francisco Bay Area in 1970 and walked in such a wonderful place. However, when I walked into my classroom, the Indian students were not there. I went back and inquired, you know, this is why I decided to teach in uh, American Indian Studies. Where are the Indian students? Well, they were out on the rock. They were out on the Alcatraz. They were wanting to, to have that piece of land returned to uh, indigenous peoples. They wanted to build an all Indian university of the plains, and they wanted to the ships that entered San Francisco Bay to see Indian land first. And so they began, the, the occupiers began coming back to school, enrolled in classes, and it was really in the heyday of activism. And Native American Studies was one of uh, four programs in the Department of Ethnic Studies. And for the first time in our lives, at least in the higher education level, we could teach about who we are how we view the world, what our history has been with its sadness and, and its happiness. We could teach the 
kinds of wisdom and knowledge handed down through the generations. We could reinforce our identities, as, as I hope that the students did, and I think they did, as this land's first and beloved peoples. It was an experience, and maybe an experiment initially, to begin to institute the study of this nation's first peoples in the academic curriculum of institutions of higher education. It was a joy, it was a huge responsibility, and it's one that I traveled and worked in for some four decades. That was Professor Henrietta Mann. Well, mushing is in his blood. Ryan Reddington won the Iditarod this year. His grandfather co-founded the race in 1973, but Ryan is the first in his family to win. I interviewed him earlier this month. Ryan, it's great to have you on. Welcome. Thank you. So you're now the Iditarod champion. Congratulations to you. What has the last week been like for you? Yeah, it's been very, very amazing. It was We had a tremendous race coming into Nome. Like you said, we had a really good battle with Richie um, Deal and Pete Kaiser and both Alaska Native mushers and, and uh, the last few days racing um, in Eskimo country and, and all the beautiful scenery and uh, all the all the people along the way and the, the large amount of people in Nome and the celebrations afterwards. It's been a, a dream of mine to finally came true. Your grandfather helped found this race and he's known actually as the father of the Iditarod. What would you what do you think he would say if he was still here to see you win the event? I think you say very good. I'm very proud of you, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, first place gets a 90 pound bronze statue of my grandpa. And that that's always been my dream. It's to take home that trophy. And I'm really excited to bring home that trophy to the family and to my, my town of Kinnick here. As I mentioned earlier, uh, all of the podiums there were all Alaska Native finishers. Um, tell us what that was like to sort of share that moment with other Indigenous people. It's very special, and it's, um, like I said, Richie and Pete are great, great competitors, great sportsmanship, and and we're all very proud to, to uh, be Alaska Native mushers and to represent us well in the in the in the Iditarod and in uh, the Native communities that we pass through along the way. We're so supportive and so happy and so proud, and I'm proud to be Eskimo and very, very excited for for the Native communities. I actually would like to talk more about the journey that you had because you quite literally traveled across the state of Alaska. Um, tell us more about those Alaska Native communities that you passed and maybe how you were kind of mentally keeping um, a good mind throughout the race. Yeah, when when we arrive at the villages along the way, the the native communities, um, the every person from the entire village will come out and cheer on the dogs and the mushers, and they were so excited and and it felt different this year with us three leading leading the race, and it uh, I, I, it helped keep me in in the race, it, their excitement and their cheering. And it was very supportive and greatly appreciated. And I'm just so, so thrilled to win the race for for the Alaska Native community and the Reddington family. And, and so proud of my dogs. I want to actually talk more about your dogs. Tell us about the leaders, uh, Ghost and Sven. Yeah, Ghost is six years old. She's finished the last four I did rods with me and in lead and um just an amazing amazing dog super smart gene ha and um i'm so excited for her to be a champion and sven as well sven is four years old and it's his first i did rod finish and he both both lead dogs were outstanding throughout the race and and there was times where Ghost near the end of the race, she was jumping all four feet off the ground with just a couple miles to go. She she knew where the finish line was, and she was so 
su su such an amazing competitor and very, very honored to have her on my team. I wonder how do you sleep or eat or rest over the eight days that it took you to cross the state? Yeah, we, we run about seven hours and rest about four hours. That was my schedule. And I would, um, I, I would get about 30 to 35 minutes of sleep each time that I would stop and, and, um, I'd eat, I'd eat, um, vacuum sealed my we vacuum sealed my meals before the race and i just drop it in the hot water when it was heating up to thaw out the food for the dogs and and um uh, and it was tunnel vision trying to get all of my chores done as quickly as possible and then to the more quickly i got my chores done the the more minutes i could sleep are there any other reddingtons who are coming along in this sport yeah, yeah. My niece and nephew both race in the junior Iditarod, and this year my niece Ellen finished third in the junior Iditarod, and my nephew Isaac finished fifth, and he won Rookie of the Year in the junior Iditarod. It's a 150-mile race for 14- to 17-year-olds. And my my kids, my daughter Eve, Eve Violet and my son Thomas Joseph, they both raced this year in a race in Minnesota and they've been, they're very doggy kids and I hope they carry on the family tradition. That was 2023 Iditarod winner Ryan Reddington. The American Indian Science and Engineering Society is 6,000 members strong and is a leader in student development. ICT Shirley Snavy has this interview with its president, Sarah Echohawk. ASIS has awarded nearly a million dollars a year in scholarships. Sarah Echohawk is its president and she joins me today. So I wanted to talk to you about research as far as what we're finding out about students going into STEM fields. Well, what we're finding out uh, about Native American students or Indigenous students going into STEM fields is that that number of uh, students who are graduating with STEM degrees has actually declined in recent years. So we're not seeing an increase or even remaining steady in terms of Native students graduating with those STEM degrees, which is, of course, unfortunate given that uh, the fastest growing, highest paying jobs in the nation are generally STEM, uh, STEM careers. So when we talk about issues of equity, we really need to see Native people in those jobs and uh, specifically more Native women in those jobs. So what, what, what can we do about this? What's going wrong? I mean, uh, is there a solution? There are a lot of solutions. Um, most of those, and you know, as as Indigenous peoples, we 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 kind of already know this, but it's it's really getting this across to um, administrators and policymakers and others that you know make these kinds of decisions about curriculum um, and um, the way that we're teaching and engaging students. So one of uh, one of our strategies has been first of all starting much further back um, with students. So not waiting until they get into even high school or on to college, right, to start saying, oh, hey, have you considered going into a STEM field? Instead, backing way up in the PK, so even preschool, although I wouldn't say we have any preschool programs yet, but we're heading that direction, but that PK through 12 space, right, to get students engaged early and interested in STEM. And for Indigenous students, what that means is culturally contextualized um, curriculum. So having uh, curriculum and other STEM resources that are really tailored to Indigenous students and specifically in their specific communities, right? There is not, you know, one definition or one Native American or Indigenous culture, right? We're all of these different tribal nations. So how do we work within these communities and within the schools and the educators to bring in resources that are again, like culturally contextualized for that specific community. And an example of that would be this Intel. Intel has sponsored a project for several years now where we actually co-created a high school course for um, students that are interested in going into tech on the Navajo reservation. And of course, um, doing exactly what we said, working with community members in those um, different communities within Navajo um, to bring in cultural experts, if you will, um, and others to help advise us on creating curriculum. Like an example would be um, Danae Weaving as a mathematics, like looking at that from a mathematics perspective. 
So it's bringing those pieces in that makes it more relevant and engages students um, in that. And they can actually see, oh, yeah, I can be in a STEM field. Like, this does make sense to me. So the answers are going back to what we know as Indigenous people, integrating that into the curriculum and supporting students early on so that they can be prepared to go into a STEM field in college. Often there are a lot of prerequisites um, required. And so if students haven't been properly prepared by the time they get to college, they would have to spend a lot of extra time and money to get those prerequisites. So we wanna make sure that they're getting that done ahead of time. Sarah, I understand you've been with ACES for a decade now. What's that experience been like? So it's just been really a privilege to be a part of this tremendous growth of this organization. And I would say that's not unique to ACES. Um, definitely seen the growth in a lot of national Native nonprofit organizations in the last decade, particularly in the last you know four, three three to five years. And I think that means you know that people are finally starting to take notice externally about the value and about what we have to offer as Indigenous peoples, and that's where you're seeing this growth. So it's been tremendous. Um, I'm excited for the future. We just went through another you know, strategic planning process, and we, um, we have a lot of plans for the future and continued growth. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.